Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the latest edition of the LA Kings Alumni Conversation. Uh, my name is Jeff Moeller. Uh, I head up the club's heritage efforts and the LA Kings Alumni Association. The following uh, gentlemen who were um, blessed to be featuring here today uh, need no formal introduction to you. Uh, Jim Fox, Daryl Evans. But what you probably don't know is that uh, both gentlemen are celebrating a special anniversary. 40 years with the LA Kings as both Daryl and Jim were originally drafted by the Kings in 1980. So uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us from the living rooms. Uh, Foxy, <laughs> kind of throw it over to you initially. Uh, 40 years uh, since you were first a member of the LA Kings and obviously that 10 years remained 40 consecutive years. Uh, can you believe it? Wow. Uh, it's so interesting to me because when I think back on certain, you know, so many things come to your mind and it's not that vivid. Maybe it's because I'm getting old. But, <laughs> but then if someone brings something up, then it's like, bang, you're right back in that moment, right back in that spot. So uh, 40 years, I would have to say, geez, it's, I know players say this all the time, it has gone so, so fast. Uh, at the same time, to put all the memories together, uh, I need a little help. But when I get that help, it all comes back. Daryl, uh, where were you 40 years ago? Were you at the draft? Uh, what are your recollections of draft day for you? You know, it was a, it was a very special day. I remember being invited there. I was a 19-year-old, and that was the year that the NHL reverted back to the 18-year-old draft. So I was kind of monkey in the middle there a little bit. But... I remember being asked to go to the draft and it was in Montreal at the old forum. So just being able to step in that building had a special, uh, you know, a special memory there. Uh, you know, just all the history that was in that building, uh, walking around there, checking out the hallways and things like that. It was special, but uh, you know, hearing your name come uh, regardless of where it was in the draft. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, you know, something that I'll never forget. Uh, being that it was the Los Angeles Kings at that time, a non-traditional hockey market was, uh, something a little bit different from a lot of my teammates. Uh, they were going to the traditional teams in Chicago, Detroit and, and things like that. So uh, I was kind of, you know, the one going, kind of opening up and going out and reaching into a different area, but uh, it's uh, something that I'll always remember. Uh, both of you obviously are from Eastern portion of Canada, Los Angeles is a long ways away uh, back before, you know, the satellite and, and all the games being broadcast, they are now on television uh, you hear L.A. for the first time, uh, Daryl, and then Jim. What, what, what was initially going through your mind? Well, I think, you know, when you hear of Los Angeles, uh, you know, Toronto's kind of like the Los Angeles of Canada, you know, so to speak. <laughs> but, no, uh, you know, Los Angeles, it was like, you know, even though you'd watch the Kings play a little bit of hockey, we didn't get, you know, too many of their games because of the time change in that. But, uh, you know, I, I think it was uh, – it was, you know, it was almost posed like a little bit of a challenge. Like this is going to be an experience that, uh, you know, I hope will be a special one. And as I look back now, 40 years later, it, uh, it was an incredible journey, you know, to this point. And so many great members, as Jim says, you know, sometimes you got to get poked a little bit to, you know, to reflect upon some of the times, but uh, you know, coming to Los Angeles and stepping foot here on the ground and seeing the beaches, you know, even stepping up to the forum. I mean, that was such a, uh, you know, the building itself was, you know, it just had such an impression upon me just seeing that, especially with the parking lot empty, the way it stood, stood there in the middle. And, uh, you know, it, it was really neat. But, uh, you know, it uh, definitely uh, was something different. And uh, it's uh, something that had a change and uh, impact in my life uh, 40 years from now. Yeah, for me, it was, you know, I grew up in a small town, 2,500 people, Coniston, just outside of Sudbury. Uh, I played three years in Ottawa, so I had a little bit of a bigger city. Uh, I was used to that a little bit. But when I heard Los Angeles, the first thing that came to mind for me, I know the, uh, the writers that got on a call uh, that called me that day were, had a little chuckle about it was, you know, first thing that came to mind for me was, well, you know what? I've been to Florida. I, I mean, I've, I've been to the <laughs> beach. I've been to the And they're all chuckling. This kid has no idea that Los Angeles <laughs> is way on the other side of the country. Believe me, I was a geography major. I knew it. But the first thing that came to me was beaches. And we're going to the beach. Never had a chance to experience it on the West Coast, but finally that chance. 
didn't know a lot about the Kings, in all honesty. Followed hockey as closely as anyone. But like Daryl was pointing out, when you don't get that opportunity to watch night after night after night, uh, you get lost in that. And I think uh, the Kings and a lot of West Coast teams feel that way. And that probably was the way it was. Because as far as the roster, yeah, I knew the top seven, eight, nine guys. But after that, uh, it was one of those new things to me. Uh, Foxy, you ultimately a first-round pick along with Larry Murphy in that 1980 class. Uh, I'll ask you the same question too, Daryl, but leading up to the draft, um, did you feel as if, you know, uh, there was a great deal of attention? Uh, were you focused on those next steps? Uh, you know, did you feel the presence of scouts, so to speak? I was used to that. Uh, Daryl mentioned it earlier. We both got caught in the middle where I actually had a chance to sign with the Colorado Rockies the previous season. Uh, Brian Kilray was the head coach in Ottawa. Really good friends with Don Cherry, who was the coach in Colorado at the time. Uh, they were talking back and forth. And in all honesty, one of the reasons I respect guy, Brian Kilray is this. He said, go. He said, you're ready? Go. Uh, you know, he knew it was going to hurt his team, but he didn't. He just said, I think you're ready. Go ahead and it'll give a chance to go. I didn't go, stayed around, and that helped me as far as the draft because now I'm a first-round pick. I'm going in, you know, if I'm going to be completely honest, in the, on the hockey news, the, the issue going in, I was rated second overall, number two. I knew I wasn't going there because my agent was Art Kaminsky, and he had been talking to people, and I think there was a little politics going on and <laughs> the placement and things of that sort. But uh, I knew I was going to go in the first round. Uh, where? No idea. But uh, I, I was not in Montreal, didn't go. Uh, it, it wasn't as big back then as it is now, the event that it is. But once I heard, uh, it's just something that you do never forget. You, you have it etched. I was on the phone, received the call. It was very short and sweet. We'll be back to you with more details later. But uh, congratulations, you're drafted. Uh, I knew Larry Murphy, had played against him for years, had played with him that year at the uh, – World Junior Championships, uh, so I knew that going in. So had a chance to know a few guys, but uh, a very special day at any time just to hear your name called. Yeah, and I think uh, you know when you look at that, you know, being in Toronto, we had a lot of the scouts come to a lot of the games at different times because there were so many teams within close proximity to each other. So it was not uncommon to see a lot of scouts at the games, and and you knew they were going to be there. And I think you know, that may have elevated the play of, you know, of young guys, you know, getting that type of exposure. So, uh, but still, you know, you know, regardless of how good a year you're having or how good a year your team is having, you know, till it actually comes to fruition, where you actually hear your name being called, uh, that, then it becomes reality. But um, as Jim just mentioned, you know, times have changed quite a bit since then with regards to the draft, uh, the interaction between the teams, you know, you look at the development camps and things that they have now, I mean, they connect with you right away. Back at that time, it was a quick phone call, as Jim said. Well, you know, we'll get back to you. And sometimes, you know, in a case like mine, it wasn't until training camp. Uh, you know, it wasn't like we communicated all summer and things like that. You know, you got a basic program. But uh, I think the interaction now between the athlete and the teams, uh, you know, getting out for that development camp. So when they do actually come to a training camp, they're so much more at ease. Like we, we were like we were on pins and needles when we went to camp. We didn't know who to say hi to, who not to say hi to, where to go to if we needed something. But I think they've, you know, taken down all those doors. And what it does is it better prepares these young guys uh, to go out and perform when training camp actually starts. You know, uh, Jim mentioned Larry Murphy. Uh, if you look back at that 1980 draft class for the L.A. Kings, I believe um, nine of the first ten players or, or eight of the first ten players ultimately played in the NHL, though not all for the Kings. Um, looking back at that moment, do you just – is it kind of a natural reaction to – who else was drafted with us? Do I, do I know any of these guys? Have I played against them? Um, was there any guy that maybe we drafted uh, that you didn't want to play with, uh, just kind of going back in time, so to speak? Uh, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, you, you know the guys. I, I think when you get to camp, I had the very much the same feeling Daryl just described, where you just really, I was really uncomfortable. You know, I came from being the big wheel, the big man on campus. And now you're just, you know, really struggling to try to make the team. That's the way position I was in. And uh, I think 
I cozied up to guys I played against, Larry Murphy and Greg Terrion. And, uh, Daryl, I'll never forget the first time. I, I didn't really meet Daryl, but we were playing against his team in Niagara Falls. And uh, he, was not, he was injured that game. But um, we were doing our pregame warm-up. We're skating around. And uh, here's this guy standing on the bench. And he is decked out. <laughs> He's got the free piece. He's got the fedora. If I'm not mistaken, he might even be having a cane there. And he was all <laughs> dressed up. And he was kind of right there on the doorstep that leads to the door that goes to the, uh, to the, to the ice from the bench. And, you know, skating around. Uh, really good team. Uh, Daryl's team. Some, a lot of players were drafted off that team into the NHL. Um, it, it's just, I think you go to those guys you know, and you just try to find, you know, just some some type of comfort zone. And and if you can get that, then I think it helps you play a little bit better. And I think I remember, in particular, just prior to even junior hockey, when Jim was playing, uh, and I used to go watch him play at North York Centennial there when, uh, you know, North Bay was in and, and they were playing against the, you know, the North York Rangers there. And I remember picking up on his name at that time because you used to read about it in the paper and that, and, and you know, you, you want to go see it. It was kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, I remember going back even further, re, you know, reading and learning about Wayne Gretzky. And this was a kind of like the impression impact that I had at that time. I remember a lot of my buddies at school, we'd go watch, you know, Foxy play. And, uh, I mean, the team was great, and Foxy lived up to the billing. I mean, you know, from that, the first time that I saw Foxy play, it was amazing the set of hands that he had and the gift that he had to be able to put the puck in the net, and that carried through to his career in the NHL. So I remember I remember that going into North York Centennial Arena and, you know, looking for this guy, Jim Fox, and then watching the way that he was able to uh, to perform on the ice and eventually, you know, live his dream up and get, him, get himself to the NHL. Hey, guys, you know what, Daryl? Um, if, you know, I, I think we can talk about it now. I don't know who it was. I really don't. But I remember walking into the locker room the first time. And, we, you know, you strip down and you get into your skivvies to put your equipment on. And, you know, I was five, seven. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, back then, I was 170 pounds my first year. Uh, that's the way I played my last year of junior. Uh, and I, re I remember hearing some guys in the back, man, is he ever small? <laughs> man, is he ever small? And those were like my teammates. And it was just, it kind of worried me a little bit. But again, you, you hope that you're on ice stuff. And again, I'm joining a team that has Marcel Dion on it. So he's 5'6", right. but <laughs> he's a little bit stockier than me. How's that? But that's, that's kind of the, you know, the uneasiness you go into and you, you try to, you try. You have to prove yourself, but then you, you know you have your own teammates going. Oh, man, it's so small, it's so small. <laughs> I think especially too when you you know you come from being on your junior team for our, you know a lot of us were you know we were stars on our junior team. We put up big numbers, and like you say, you you make that presence in the locker room. You show up. You're a little bit on the slight side, and you know everybody kind of looks at it and you. Go, oh, this you know this kid will never be able to do it. You know at this level, and you know so you got to kind of. It's almost like you got to prove yourself again, and I think. I think that was a common thing for a lot of guys, regardless, like you say, Jim, you know, and you were drafted up high and, you know, there's big expectations and all that to, you know, to me or all the way down to the other end of the draft that, uh, you know, you had, to, you had to come every day, like was your last day. You know, you can, you can overdo things and you can overthink things. And if there's anything in my career that I wish I could do over again is to get more help with this because my head was always spinning and I was always thinking. And I remember, uh, Daryl, the first preseason game I played, I was on the B squad. I wasn't with the NHL players and that, you know, it just worried me. And I'm being completely honest here because yeah. Daryl said, I'm coming off the team. I led the OHL in scoring. I'm, you know, the big wheel. And, you know, Larry was fourth overall. I'm 10th overall coming in. And then, you know, I didn't make that first, uh, you know, I played some other preseason games, but that one we were playing. And I would say maybe three or four guys were from the Kings and the rest were, are going to end up in the minor leagues and at least my first year when I tried to make the team uh, that year the Kings had a little difficulty I think Houston was their minor league affiliate yep. in the central was, league yep. in the central league and the relationship wasn't really going that well I think I would have if it was a normal situation I think I would have started in the American Hockey League but 
I think the Kings were a little, uh, they were a little skeptical about what was going down in Houston and they didn't want to send me there. So I ended up, you know, I think I didn't play like 10 games my first year, healthy scratch, uh, you know, in and out fourth line, all those things. In hindsight, I, I'm kind of glad that's the way it was. Uh, but at the same time, who knows, development-wise, whether some time in the AHL might have helped. You just don't know. You know, you talk about playing that first exhibition game, and I, too, you know, one of my first outings was to play on that B squad. And uh, that particular day, uh, the trainers, they'd forgotten, or Charlie Simmer skate broke. And I actually played in both games. I played the B game and the A game. I played a double header that game. And I remember back at that time, training camp, and uh, – from the financial end, the end of it was we got paid a hundred dollars an exhibition game. So we played nine games that year and I got paid a thousand dollars. I thought I died and gone to heaven. But uh, I remember playing that double header and, you know, the first game, you know, those B games were always, you know, you're looking down the other roster and it wasn't how many goals or anybody scored. It was how many penalty minutes they had. And there were so many guys with four or 500 penalty minutes. And you were wondering if they were drafted from junior or from prison at that time. But, uh, it uh, you know th those were the fun days and some of those some of those B squad games boy they they, they lasted for hours <laughs> I mean it was just till till everybody had at least fought once and that was the end of it. Hey Reggie, yeah, my first game up in the Nimo or something again. We're based <laughs> in Victoria. I line up the first guy I line up against Tiger Williams. Oh, exactly gee. what you're talking about. I'm going oh my god here we go. <laughs> Of course, had a chance to play with him when he came to the Kings, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll remember that skating on the ice the first time. Oh, uh, and there were so many guys around at that time. I remember, like, and you talked about Houston, you know, in the Central League, they folded during that year. So after I finished my junior year, I went from Brantford and I went up to Saginaw, and that's where the guys from Houston got sent to Saginaw uh, in the International League. So I, I had Don Perry, who was coaching there. Um, you know, he asked me to hang around. I played the last three games of the regular season. I became a black ace for the playoffs. And I remember, like, those last three games of the regular season, we were playing against guys that were in slap shot. And, you know, I, I had that same thing. You, you look over your shoulder, and you look at this mountain of a guy with a beard down to his knees, and you're going like, oh, my God. You know, is this what I got myself into? And I think I trembled for three straight days, all three of those games. And then I was happy to be just there as a black ace for the playoffs. <laughs> Sounds like that – Sounds like there was a, a group of Italian brothers you played when you played in <laughs> The Benigetti brothers up, oh. in, up in Zoldo, Italy. Eight brothers and three cousins. They still <laughs> haunt me. <laughs> uh, obviously, in hockey, you come across many different uh, type of characters, so to speak. Uh, Jim, you mentioned uh, Marcel earlier. Uh, you mentioned Tiger, who we ended up playing with uh, later on. Uh, as a rookie, you broke in with Larry. You broke in with Greg Terrion who unfortunately uh, recently passed away. Uh, did you guys kind of stick together as young players, um, or did you feel uh, you were able to blend in with some of the older players on occasion? Uh, for Greg and I, it was, you know, fourth line duty, sporadic here and there. Played together a lot, mostly with Steve Jensen our first year. Uh, I think with Larry, under the new rules, he would be the Calder Trophy winner as the Rookie of the Year. Peter Stastny ended up winning it because he comes over. He was a little older and more mature, but Larry was dominant. Even back then, they were giving Larry practices off. That's how much he was playing during games. And he was, he was younger than us, so he comes in and yep. just you know, takes over. Uh, Greg, more of that you know, top scorer and junior, had to redefine his game in the NHL where he's becoming more of a penalty killer a checker, a fourth line guy. We lived together. <laughs> and uh, I always, for people who live in Los Angeles, I, I like to say now, back then I really didn't know. I just took it for granted. But we rented a three bedroom spot. And I'll never forget, 4214, The Strand, Manhattan Beach, California. And uh, the Bermuda Triangle was there. They had Harry O's. They had Poncho's, which is still there. They had Orville and Wilbur's. Yep. And occasionally, because we had some good luck with Canadian bartenders, we were able to have a drink every once in a while because we were all underage. Uh, I do remember one night, we played the Boston Bruins 
And, you know, it's a big game. I believe it ended up 2-1. Now, growing up, Boston was my team. That was my, I just, anyway, we go, Larry and Greg and I, we go to, you know, we go out. And, so we're stumbling back home. Saturday night game, probably didn't have another game until Tuesday, maybe even Thursday that week. You know, sometimes you have that. Well, we ended up walking back to our place together at around 1.30. We open up the door and our house is packed. <laughs> it's packed. It's the Kings and the Boston Bruins and they're all in there and they're partying. One of our friends, Tom Plymas, who lived right around the corner from us who became a producer on Channel 5 Sports, uh, he had a key. He went in, opened it up. They had this big party going on. We had the air bubble hockey game going. Kings against Bruins playing against each other. I remember walking in. Wayne Cashman is sitting right on my couch. And I'm <laughs> this is the, these are the guys I grew up watching. It was incredible. Not the entire team. I'd say seven or eight guys from each team. But the, uh, I don't think that would happen nowadays. <laughs> I know why you work so hard to get off that fourth line, Fox. You didn't want to skate with Steve Jensen. That's all. You didn't want to try to keep up with him in the races. What a set of legs he had. But, um, you, you know, I, I remember that. And I remember, like, when we came in that, in that next year and you talked about you, you guys were kind of the talk of town, you know, the, the group that you guys had down at the beach there. And, you know, before that, it was the Glenn Goldups and the Rick Chartras and those type of guys. And, uh, you know, and Charlie was at the beach, you know, before he'd got married. So, uh, you know, it seems like it just got passed on from, you know, from the veteran players. And, you know, I think your your group was probably the last group that experienced the beach because then everybody started to kind of move a little, a little bit away from there. And we had a guy, Daryl, you'll remember him, Jerry Ferguson. Yeah. He's a guy that hung around the team. No official capacity. <laughs> uh, he was, a, a, you know, a Vietnam vet. Yeah. And he, you know, he, he worked in the security areas. Uh, not necessarily for the Kings, but man, when we went into a bar, he would stand on the other side and he would just be there watching. Yeah. And if anything, anything, I remember a couple guys come up to Larry Murphy in Harry O's and they were just joshing with him and let, we're just joking, but it was kind of like they were, they were giving him some digs and, you know, trash talking, <laughs> chirping him a little bit. And Jerry heard that from behind. And he walks up, he has a, a dime in his hand at the time. That's back 1980. <laughs> he claps the dime on the bar to the guys that are talking to Larry. He says, guys, you better call an ambulance right now because you're going to need it. <laughs> and he, with him, you believed it. Yep. We're driving from the forum to the beach one night after a game. Jerry's driving a limo for somebody. We don't know. I remember I bought a Volvo my first year. That's my personality, <laughs> <laughs> the conservative. And Larry's in the car with me and we're driving and we stop and light right in front of the Marriott Hotel on Century Boulevard, just before the airport. You take the yep. right and then you're going to go down. Roll down my window. Jerry's, because he kind of gets our attention. He, we're right at the light. Man, oh man. He looks at us, he's got this big grin on his face. He pulls out a gun and he points it right at us. <laughs> and he, he says, hey, guys, you'll be OK tonight. But he's pointing a freaking gun at us. After you change your shorts. In there. <laughs> uh, Daryl, kind of a, a weird transition. Uh, Foxy talking about security. I don't think a lot of people know this, but you, too, played a police officer uh, in a very short lived uh, way, did you not? <laughs> what in my my extra roll at the airport? <laughs> I did. Uh, I had, had purchased an, an old '56 Corvette, and in the off season, uh, I put it in. Uh, you know, I'd set it up to you know to use it in uh, photo shoots and, and movies and things like that, or TV shows, whatever it be. So the one day I I took it and you know, I just had my workout clothes in and uh, people that I was uh, you know delivering the card to, they said, oh, you know what, you know. If you got to take the car around, you know, why don't you, uh, you know, put your name in as well? You know, it could be an extra. Ah, no, I, you know, I can't do that kind of stuff. All right. So they talked me into it. So we go to this one set and uh, I got to show up uh, at LAX and I'm going to be a policeman. 
they're going to be a cop. So <laughs> I'm kind of chuckling to myself. Uh, here I am, five foot nothing. And uh, we go. And uh, so I got to go from wardrobe. So I go to wardrobe. They get me all fitted up and this and that. And they actually hand me a gun, which I thought was cool, cool, real cool part of my costume. But from wardrobe, I had to go to makeup. <laughs> and I'll never forget the you know, person saying, you know, take him to makeup and tone his forehead down a little bit. You know, I kind of look back. We need to turn, tone my forehead down a little bit. You know, I thought I had quite a few feathers back at that time. But uh, I remember doing that and uh, playing a role. And I had a, it was an HBO special, I believe. And I had to escort a, a guy out of the airport. And uh, I, I threw a couple of words. And I, I wasn't supposed to say anything, but I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And, you know, and so... I had my little, my two minutes of, or two seconds of Hollywood uh, success right there at the airport. <laughs> you can tell the difference, right? 56 <laughs> Corvette, <Yeah>. Volvo. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, that was, that was a few years down the road, Foxy. When I first got okay. there, I had a, I had a Toyota, uh, Toyota Celica. That was, those are my wheels. Two different color and, doors, I think. <laughs> and there's nothing, from that 80 draft though, the origin, the birth, of the undefeated tank team champions <laughs> of the world. Sky Jerry low, Lynch low, the Bemidji yep. kid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, undefeated. Guys, as we um, look to wrap things up here, we're going to hit you each with one uh, last question. Uh, kind of going back to hockey. Um, Daryl, I'm going to ask you first, kind of maybe summarize, you know, your King's career on the ice. Obviously, you know, well known for the miracle on Manchester, and, and obviously well deserved. Um, but I think a lot of people were like, didn't know you didn't have a lot of time with the Kings before that. You had the big playoff moment that next year. I think you did play 80 games, which was a career high. Kind of looking back, how do you sort of sum up your Kings playing career into words? Uh, you know, it was a, it was a special time. Uh, you know, I don't think I would have changed anything. Uh, the way, you know, the way that I approached everything, uh, would I like to have continued to keep playing for the Kings? Of course. I mean, would have loved to have had a, you know, a long career and, you know, play my whole career out as a member of the Kings. But uh, the short time that I did have as a player with the Kings, uh, it'll be a time I never forgot. I always look upon them as, you know, the team that drafted you, giving you a chance that had the belief that you could play in the NHL. And I think that that always holds, you know, a, a special part uh, for me. Uh, you know, the success that we had that year in the playoffs, uh, it was a great moment in, in King's history, a uh, great moment in, in my career to have such a, you know, have had such an impact and impression on that on that particular series. And then the next year, you know, I thought I had a decent year uh, putting up uh, 18 goals and, and 40 points. I thought that was a decent year. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I never got a chance to kind of expand upon that. Uh, after that was, you know, up and down uh, in the minors. So, you know, with the Kings, I had success in the American Hockey League. Scored 51 goals down there. Uh, followed it up with over 40 goals uh, when I played with Washington's farm team in the American League. But never, uh, never had uh, you know the opportunity to you know to accomplish uh, what I hope to accomplish one day in the NHL. But again, as I look back at it, uh, it was an incredible part of my life, uh, a chapter that I'll never forget. That's led to incredible things uh, where we stand here today, 40 years later after being drafted. In Jim's career, uh, 10 years on the ice uh, from 1980 to 1990, but uh, also, didn't get to finish uh, the way you would have liked in terms of injury. Um, can't do anything about that, but you look back at that 10-year run. Um, how do you summarize it into words? Uh, yeah, it's um, uh, disappointing. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I was able to live up to what I thought I would have brought to the Kings. Uh, you know, from the numbers I had in junior compared to what, you know, didn't make that uh, jump to the NHL as well as I would have liked. Uh, there were some times, yes, where you know injury was an issue, and especially at the end. Uh, that's where you, you know, in all honesty, I, I felt I was just, when I was injured, ended up retiring because I was injured, missed the full season, came back, played a few games, and then retired. Uh, but just before the injury was, I f felt I was just starting to get it, if you could believe that. My numbers were a little bit down offensively, but I was starting to do more things and be more involved that way. So uh, on the ice, uh, you know, it's just, it's disappointing. That's the way it went. Uh, you, you give it, you don't have another try, uh, try at it. You don't have another opportunity, but uh, that's, that's the way it went. And, uh, and I wish it would have been a little bit better that way. Uh, 
Uh, I will remember it because, again, I know Daryl and I have now you know, come back and we work together. We're daily. Uh, you know, you, you hear all the time they're saying about players, they say the one thing they miss when they retire is the camaraderie. Well, I will say this about Daryl. He is one of those types of guys you miss because, uh, you know, I remember back in the first few camps he was talking about, you know, he was both a forward and an defenseman. He, he, would, he would do three shifts in a row, three sessions in a row because they needed guys to fill in here and there. Uh, you, know, you know about his personality. He's the type of guy that, you know, brings teams together. And those are the types of things you miss when you're done. Um, and, you know, we've been fortunate now to come back and be able to hopefully uh, end in the same place we started. And, Daryl, uh, obviously, uh, in your post-playing career, uh, from a broadcasting standpoint, um, in your role, uh, being with Jim Fox on the TV side, uh, just how much do you appreciate, you know, the job he does uh, from the for the Kings end from that perspective? Well, I think it all started, you know, when I first came back. And, you know, at that time, Jim was teamed up with, you know, with Bob Miller, uh, you know, an incredible team that I watched night in and night out whenever I was watching games and obviously listening to Nick. And I spent a lot of time in the car at that time. And I was I was listening to Nick and he had a couple of different, uh, you know, partners as as I was making that kind of the transition till I eventually rejoin the Kings, but I, I was blessed. I was so fortunate. Uh, you know, I, I come into uh, a situation where you got two guys that have already been put in the Hall of Fame, and there's no doubt in my mind that Jim Fox will make his way to the Hall of Fame as well as a broadcaster. I think he does an incredible job. And from that trio of guys, from the time that we spent, whether it's on the plane, on the road, uh, you know, here in Los Angeles, you learn so much from, from those guys. And, uh, you know, I, I try to, you know, take a little bit from, from each one of them. And, I you know, I admire the job that they've done. Uh, being that Jim and I kind of do the similar job, um, you know, on radio and on TV, um, I, I really have, a, you know, a, a appreciation for his perspective, uh, you know, for just seeing the way that he sees the game. Uh, and then, you know, when I got the opportunity to be able to work, you know, with him on Fox Sports and, you know, going back this this particular year, we kind of, you know, changed things up a little bit where, you know, Jim and I were, you know, like uh, a little bit more involved uh, together on the segments we were in. I thought it was great, and I thought it brought a great perspective. So uh, I've always cherished the time that, you know, I've worked with those guys, but in particular, Jim, because we both come from the same cloth. Uh, we grew up as players, uh, make the transition into, you know, becoming a broadcaster. And I and I know from the way Jim approaches his daily uh, routine, the same as myself, it, it's a learning experience every day. And, you know, we, we don't take anything for granted. We work hard, but uh, uh, I'm very grateful and thankful for the, you know, the team that I work with and, and I mean that broadcasting team. And now that, you know, Alex has joined our group uh, and the guys, uh, you know, Patrick and, you know, Sean and, and, and Jared and, uh, you know, Carlin and Alex, uh, you know, like it just, there, there's so many different people that, you know, have had an impression and impact. But uh, as from working with Jim, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, I, I always look forward to because of, you know, the experience that he has and the professionalism and the way he approaches his job each and every day. Gentlemen, 40 years. Congratulations. Do you have another 40 in you? Yeah, you want to make the reservation now? We'll set it up. We might not be Zooming by then. Who knows what we'll be doing? Hey, what, Jeff, one game at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for your time. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll be back soon.